In the last section, we discussed the two most fundamental trigonometric functions, sine and cosine. Uh, there are four other standard trigonometric functions, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Uh, we need to go over those. Um, they're defined in terms of sine and cosine, so it's still true that knowing about sine and cosine, they're kind of the fundamental thing, but we need to talk about these other four trig functions. So the definitions that we give generalize what you should know from the study of trig involving right triangles. So what should the tangent of an angle mean, whether you call the angle theta or x or t? What should the tangent mean? Well, from triangles, you're probably used to the opposite side over the adjacent side. If we, if we use a triangle with hypotenuse 1, whose length is 1, we know that the opposite side here has length sine theta. And the adjacent side has length the cosine of theta. So just as you should know from triangles, tangent is sine theta over cosine theta. In a similar way, we define the other three trig functions in terms of sine and cosine. So what's cotangent? Well, so, oh, I should write the full words. This is tangent. This is cotangent. Cotangent, well, it's the adjacent side over the opposite for triangles, but since we want circular trig functions, trig functions that have values for thetas greater than 90 degrees, greater than pi over 2 radians, we define things in terms of sine and cosine. So cotangent is cosine over sine. The secant, so the secant of theta is 1 over the cosine. And the cosecant cosecant of theta is 1 over sine. And the advantage to defining these things in terms of sine and cosine is sine and cosine were our fundamental periodic functions. They're defined for all values of theta. So by using sine and cosine, that sine and cosine, to define the other four trig functions, they're defined for all values of theta for which the denominators are not zero. So I, I'm going to show you the graphs of these four functions. Um, they tell you a lot about the properties of tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. And then, of course, we want the derivatives of these functions. So we want to know the rates of change of them. Um, there are trig identities that follow from the fundamental trig identity. Um, so for instance, tan squared plus 1 of theta, uh, tan squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta, is probably the second most important trig identity for us after the fundamental one, which is that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. This is the fundamental trig identity. This one follows from that one because what's tan squared? Well, Tangent is sine over cosine, so tan squared is sine squared over cosine squared. Then you add 1, but you write 1 as cosine squared over cosine squared. Then, in, then they have the same denominator. In the numerators, you get sine squared plus cosine squared, but by the fundamental trig identity, that's 1, so you get 1 over cosine squared. Oh, but 1 over cosine is secant, so this is secant squared. So, and there are other trig identities that follow from the fundamental trig identity. And there are angle addition formulas for, for all of these functions that follow it immediately from the angle addition formulas for sine and cosine. I'm not going to go into all of those. Um, but the graphs, the graphs would give us a lot of properties of these functions. Um, of, of these four other trig functions, certainly tangent is the one that comes up most often. Um, so let's look at the graphs. Uh, 
So you can have your calculator do this, you can have computers do this. Um, later in the book, we come to a graphing section. We could figure out that the graphs look like this from using calculus techniques. But let's look at y equals, and now I'll switch to where the angle is called x, just so we can use our favorite x and y for the graph. Tangent is sine over cosine. So we are going to have places where this is undefined. Every time that cosine is 0, that occurs at pi over 2. So I'm, I'm using radians now. That occurs when x is pi over 2. And every time you go, you add another pi or you subtract another pi, this denominator will hit 0. The numerator will be plus or minus 1. So this function goes to plus or minus infinity. You will have vertical asymptotes. Um, at these values. So here's pi over 2. Here's minus pi over 2. Here's 3 pi over 2. Let's see, it should be about, well, let me draw. So let's call, say this is pi. Here's 3 pi over 2. Here's a minus pi. No, minus pi over 2. You have vertical asymptotes here, 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 and these keep going. Um, because sine and cosine are 2 pi periodic, they repeat every time x goes up or down by 2 pi, Certainly tangent, the value of tangent, repeats every 2 pi. But actually tangent has a smaller period because if you add or subtract pi from x, that negates sine and it negates cosine, but then those minus signs cancel and you get the same value again. So in fact, tangent is pi periodic. Its period is pi. So, um, and it repeats of in between these asymptotes. The graph of tangent looks roughly like this. Okay, um, how do you know it looks like this? As I said, you can have a calculator do it, you can have a computer do it. We could use calculus methods to see where the function's increasing, where it's decreasing, where it's concave up, where it's concave down. But um, for right now, let's just assume this is what tangent does. Cotangent does something similar, except it's sh shifted and looks kind of reversed. So y equals the cotangent of x. All right, so cotangent, cosine over sine. Well, now, this will have asymptotes every place that sine hits 0. That's when x is 0, and then any time you add or subtract pi. So, and, and like tangent, cotangent will be pi periodic because when x goes up or down by pi, both the numerators and denominators negate. Those negative signs cancel. And so the value of the function repeats. Oh, so we get, we have vertical asymptotes every time sine is 0. That's at every integral multiple of pi. And so we have vertical asymptotes. Actually, maybe I'll use a different color. 
the graph of this looks very similar to tangent except it's a little reversed. For instance, when x is between 0 and pi over 2, um, yeah, cosine and sine are both positive, but as you approach pi over 2, cosine goes to 0 um, and sine approaches 1, so this quotient goes to 0. But as you approach that vertical asymptote, since this is staying positive, you will go sailing off to positive infinity. So in fact, the graph of this looks kind of like a mirror image of, of what you get tangent, it has to do this. It repeats every pi as these vertical asymptotes. Right. So there's a rough graph of the cotangent. All right. We still need to look at secant and cosecant, and then we want to figure out the derivatives of these trig functions, and then we'd like to do a couple of examples using them. So, so what about secant of x? 1 over the cosine of x. Well, the, the graphs of secant and cosecant are a little, I don't know, a little strange because keep in mind the absolute value of cosine of x. Cosine is always between plus and minus 1. So the absolute value is, of course, between 0 and 1. So this is less than or equal to 1. But that, if you take reciprocals then, it means the absolute value of 1 over cosine, so the absolute value of secant, is greater than or equal to 1. So all the values of secant and cosecant, because it's 1 over sine, will be either greater than, one, greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to minus 1. So it's a little weird. Um, because you're dividing by cosine, you will have vertical asymptotes every place that cosine is 0. I mean, because you're dividing by cosine and the numerator is 1 always. So where is cosine 0? Well, just as it was a minute ago, that's at multiples of pi over 2, or pi over 2 plus or minus multiples of pi. So there's pi over 2 minus pi over 2, um, 3 pi over 2. Uh, I want to add pi, so let's... Um, unlike tangent, or cotangent, this is 2 pi periodic again, because cosine repeats every 2 pi. In tangent, there was some cancellation in the numerator and denominator. That certainly doesn't happen here. So this will be 2 pi periodic. It repeats its period is 2 pi. It doesn't repeat any earlier than that. But you do have these same vertical asymptotes you had for tangent, but what the graph does is very different. So, cosine, <coughs> the cosine of x, when x is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, so that's the, the x-coordinate on the unit circle when your angle is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, so minus 90 degrees and plus 90 degrees. That's exactly where cosine of x is positive. So this is 1 over something positive. It's always greater than or equal to 1. I'm just going to draw 1 and minus 1 here and here. So here's 1. Here's minus 1. Um, this function will always be greater than 1 and approach these asymptotes. It's, it's concave up, and it the graph is concave up and it's decreasing until between minus pi over 2 and 0 and it's increased between 0 and pi over 2. You might think that that this looks like a parabola. Look! It looks like a parabola. 
all you're seeing when you see that it looks like a parabola is that it's concave up and it first decreases and then it increases. This is not like a parabola. This graph approaches vertical asymptotes. Parabolas do not approach asymptotes. But qualitatively, when I sketch it, it kind of looks like a parabola. Maybe I should make it look more like it's coming in asymptotic, but it doesn't help too much. What happens between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2? Well, cosine of x is negative there, and its absolute value will, 1 over that will always have absolute value greater than 1, so this will be less than or equal to minus 1. It just does what that piece did, but in the negative direction. And then this repeats every 2 pi, so in the next section it would start doing the, so if you go to 5 pi over 2, you'd see this again. Let's try that one more time. And then here, of course, you see you see this. You know, that's the graph of, of secant. And cosecant looks very much like this, except shifted, just because sine looks just like cosine, except shifted. So this will be 2 pi periodic, this will be cosecant, 1 over the sine. And its graph, well, I guess I could leave these asymptotes up here, because it'll have the same asymptotes as cotangent, because it's where sine is undefined. where sine is zero, where the quotient is undefined. And again, when it's very similar to secant, when x is between zero and pi, so when your angle is between zero and pi, that's when the y-coordinate on the unit circle is greater than or equal to zero. So this will you'll be positive. If I put one here and minus one here, um, it'll do this, and then it'll do this, and then that'll repeat. All right, these are the graphs. It, you should know them. Uh, of course, your calculators can produce them for you, but it helps to know, you know how qualitatively how the, graph, how the graphs look. It gives you lots of information about these four trig functions. But of course, this is a calculus course, and what we want to know is, is what are the instantaneous rate? One of the things that we want to know most badly is what are the instantaneous rates of change of these functions? What are their derivatives? But these are easy to calculate because we know the derivatives of sine and cosine and then we can just use the quotient rule or kind of the chain rule and the power rule. So the derivatives, you should memorize these, but you, even if you didn't have them memorized, you ought to be able to re-derive them very quickly. So of course, you have to know the definitions of the trig functions. So the definition of tangent, sine over cosine. So what's the derivative of the tangent? Uh, actually, I'll just write this. What's the derivative of the tangent? It's the derivative of sine over cosine. But we can use the quotient rule. The quotient rule says that the derivative of this quotient is the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom 
all over the bottom squared. So this, oh, I left off a derivative. The bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. The derivative of sine, though, is cosine. And then we get minus sine of x. And then the derivative of cosine is minus sine all over cosine squared. But this is cosine squared minus minus, so plus sine squared. So you get cosine squared plus sine squared. Fundamental trig identity, that's 1. So this numerator comes out to be 1 over cosine squared. Um, so that's the derivative, but if we want to write it in terms of kind of the most, <laughs> the most simple expression in terms of trig functions, that's 1 over cosine quantity squared, but 1 over cosine is the secant. This is secant squared x. So this is the formula that most people memorize for the derivative of tangent. The derivative of tan x secant squared x. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll leave it as an exercise just in just the same way using the quotient rule you find the derivative of cotangent of x and what you find is it is negative cosecant squared of x. It, the derivation of that formula goes just like this. Um, you'll, you'll use the quotient rule, you'll use the fundamental trig identity, and you write things in terms of cosecant, which is 1 over sine. So let me calculate the derivative of secant, and then once again leave it as an exercise for you to do the derivative of cosecant. So. What about the derivative of secant? So, secant prime. Well, secant, by definition, is 1 over cosine. Now, it's true that we could use the quotient rule for this, but it's a little nicer, not much, but a little, to rewrite this as cosine of x raised to the minus 1 power, and then you want its derivative. Then we can calculate this derivative from the power rule and the chain rule. This is one function of x, cosine, and another function done to that. That's your setup for the chain rule. You differentiate the outside function first. So raising to the minus 1 power. So that's the power rule. The exponent comes down. You leave the inside stuff how it was. You subtract one from the exponent. But then... By the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the stuff inside. So times the derivative of the inside function. So this is negative. This is 1 over cosine squared. Sorry. Negative. You have this to the negative 2. That's 1 over cosine squared. And then derivative of cosine, negative sine. The minus signs cancel. So you end up with a plus. And then you could, so yes, the derivative of secant of x, sine x over cosine squared. That isn't how most people remember it. That isn't the formula that most people memorize. It's sine of x divided by one of these cosines and then times another 1 over cosine. And then you write this as, um, actually most people write it in the other order. I, there's no good reason to do this, but just to match most of the tables that you'll see. Write this like this. And then this is secant of x. And this is tangent of x. So secant x, tan x, or tan x, secant x, either one. It doesn't matter. So the formula that we've derived is that the derivative of secant of x, secant x, tan x. And I'll leave it as an exercise. You do exactly the same kind of thing. And you find that the derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant of x cotangent of x. All right. So those are the 
Those are the instantaneous rates of change of the other four trig functions other than sine and cosine. Um, how often do they come up? Eh, fairly often. Um, tangent in particular comes up, you know, I'd say third most often after sine and cosine. Let's look at a couple of sample problems. One purely mathematical and one more physical problem. So, one example. Find the critical points. Of W equals E to the minus theta secant of theta. All right, you have to remember what a critical point is. Uh, we, we went over this uh, back, in the first, back in the first chapter. Find the critical points of this, a critical point. It's a, a point in the domain of the original function where the derivative does not exist or the derivative equals zero. So we want to find the critical points of this. We need to look at, well, this function itself is undefined. Secant is 1 over cosine. This is undefined when cosine is 0. So this is, this is the domain of this. All theta except, well, where 1 over cosine is undefined, so that's where cosine is zero. As we said when we were graphing, that's where theta is pi over two, and then plus any integral multiple of pi, so plus k pi, where k is an integer. So for instance, when k is 0, this says it's undefined when theta is pi over 2. Um, when, when k is 1, it says it's undefined at pi over 2 plus pi, so that's at 3 pi over 2. When k is minus 1, it says the function is undefined at pi over 2 minus pi. That's when theta is minus pi over 2. Um, all right, so that's the domain of this function. What, what's the derivative of this function? dw d theta. All right, well, we have to do the product rule and the, and the chain rule, for that matter. But this is the product of two functions of theta. So the product rule says the derivative of this is the first thing times the derivative of the second plus the second thing, the secant of theta, times the derivative of the first. So we get the e to the minus theta. What's the derivative of secant theta? Well, we just found the derivative of secant of x. It was secant x tan x. So the derivative of secant theta, secant theta tan theta. And then you get a plus secant theta times, all right, the derivative of e to the minus theta. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of e to the something by the chain rule, you get the e to the something back. But by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the exponent. So times the derivative of minus theta. That gives us minus 1. So here's the derivative. We can factor out an e to the minus theta secant theta, which is the same as w. We can factor that out. This is e to the minus theta secant of theta times the tan of theta minus 1. Okay, so this is what we get for the derivative of w with respect to theta. Um, what does this tell us? Well, first of all, where is this derivative undefined? The derivative is undefined, well, you know, when secant theta is undefined, but 
that's where theta is in this range. So it's exactly where W itself was undefined. Those don't count as critical points. And then there's where tan theta is undefined. But tan theta is undefined when cosine is zero, just like this is. So the only places the derivative where this function was not differentiable are places where it wasn't defined. So there aren't any critical points that occur because the derivative is undefined at a point in the domain of W. Derivative is defined at every point in the domain of W. So the only critical points occur where this function is zero. Where is the derivative equal to zero? So I'll write dw d theta exists at all theta where w exists. So we don't get any critical points from that. So the only critical points, only critical points are where dw d theta, which is e to the minus theta secant theta times tan theta times tan theta minus 1, where that equals 0. Where does that happen? Well, e to something is never 0. Secant theta is 1 over cosine. It's never 0. The only place this can equal 0 is where tan theta equals 1. So only critical points where IE where tan theta equals 1. Where does that happen? When does tan theta equal 1? Well, it helps to remember the graph at this point, although we could use derivatives themselves to tell us much of this. So here's minus pi over 2, here's pi over 2, tangent does this, and then it repeats every pi. So where does, where does tan theta equal 1? Well, between 0 and pi over 2, tan theta equals 1, well, you should think, if you're used to triangles and degrees, you should think, oh, when theta is 45 degrees, right. But we're in a calculus class, so we need radians. It occurs at pi over 4 radians. So at pi over 4, you get 1. And that's the only time you get 1 between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. But tangent is pi periodic. You'll get, so this is at pi over 4 when you hit 1. That'll happen again every time you add pi or subtract pi from pi over 4. So um, this happens where tan theta equals 1. That happens for theta equals pi over 4 plus any integral multiple of pi. This theta equals pi over 4. That one you should know. And then tangent is pi periodic. So you have to hit 1 again every, every time you go up or down by pi. And the graph makes it clear those are the only places you get in each one of these, in each one of these sections of the graph between adjacent asymptotes, you only hit one once. Um, how, how do we know that? I mean, I, I told you the graph was like this. How could calculus tell you that? Well, we know the derivative of tan x is secant squared x. It's secant squared. That's always greater than or equal to 0. And in fact, secant is never 0 because it's 1 over cosine. So this is always greater than 0 or undefined, which means the graph is strictly increasing where it's on these intervals where it's defined, right? We know that if a function is defined on an interval and the derivative is positive there, the function is strictly increasing. So that's how we can know from a calculus point of view without using a calculator or a computer, that the graph 
increases the whole time. That, in particular, that means it, oh, one each interval between the asymptotes. In particular, that means the function is one to one inside that interval, and so there's only one theta that will give us one in each of these intervals, but then the function's periodic. So this, these are all the critical points. There are an infinite number of them. Um, it is not, you might think, ah, you're looking for where the derivative is zero. It would be where the tangent line is horizontal. I could have had my calculator or computer draw a graph of this, and I just could have looked at places where the tangent line looks horizontal. This is extremely difficult to see. Um, the e to the minus theta being here means that there's no one good window on your computer for seeing many of these critical points at once. It's um, hard to get the scale right. It's hard to get a good window. And even if you see two or three of them, you won't see many more than that. Anyway, sometimes you just have to do the calculus problem. All right. Let's, let's end this section with one application. It's, um, it's a classic problem. So suppose we have a lighthouse. So here's a lighthouse. And let's say it's a, a quarter of a mile from a beach. So the straight line distance, the perpendicular distance. So this is 0.25 miles. All right, to some point P, this closest point on the beach. And there's a little girl running along the beach. little girl running along the beach. What happens? Well, the lighthouse is shining a light and it hits the beach and as the lighthouse turns, the light sweeps along the beach. So there's some, let me erase the little girl, there's some the light from the lighthouse. Maybe I'll use yellow so it'll look like light. <laughs> um, although Lights from lighthouses might be whiter than this. But the light from the lighthouse strikes the beach and moves as the lighthouse, as the lighthouse rotates. Let's assume that the lighthouse is moving at a reasonable speed so that um, the light makes one full revolution every eight seconds. This is a reasonable speed at which a lighthouse might rotate. Makes one full revolution every eight seconds. And what's the little girl trying to do? She's trying to run along with this spot of light, trying to keep up with this spot of light as it sweeps down the beach. So the lighthouse turns, as it turns, the light sweeps down the, sleeps down, sweeps down the beach. There's the spot of light, and the little girl is trying to keep up with the spot as she runs. And the question we want to ask is when, so here's the question, when the girl is half a mile from the point P, How fast does she need to run? To keep up with the light. All right. That's our question. Um, what do you do to answer this? Well, one thing you do is draw a crummy picture like mine, or if there weren't one in the book already.
draw a crummy picture. Um, <laughs> your picture doesn't have to be very good. It just needs to be good enough to, uh, for you to see all the relevant data. What's relevant here? Well, we'd like to call the distance from the point P to the, to the beam of light, which is what the little girl's trying to keep up with. The distance from the point P to the spot on the beach where the light hits, we'll call that X. And we'll call this angle that the beam is making with the perpendicular to the beach, call that angle theta. And I'm looking at a top view. I'm looking at a top view of the situation, and I'm assuming that from this point of view, theta, that the beam of light is turning counterclockwise, which is the positive direction for us. OK, so the question is, so what is this question in terms of variables and calculus and derivative things? Our question is, what's dx dt when x is 0.5? Right? You, need, you need to understand what that, right, why that's right. How fast does she need to run if she's keeping up with the light? Well, as fast as the light's moving down the beach, which is as fast as x is growing with respect to time. So it's dx dt. When? Well, at the point in time when x is 0.5 miles, right? When you're 0.5 miles from the point P, if she's keeping up with the light, she's where the light is. So the question in terms of these variables is, what's dx dt when x is? I'm going to drop the units. We're in miles. Um, I didn't say what the time was, but because, because the light's um, rotational speed is given to us in seconds, t will be in seconds. So this is t in seconds. x in miles. And this is the question. What's dx dt when x is 0.5? All right. Well, this, this is a trig problem. Why is this a trig problem? It's a trig problem because what we know is the rate at which theta is changing. Theta is changing in such a way that you go through one full revolution every eight seconds. And we need to relate that change in theta and the fact that we know this distance to a knowledge about this distance, x. So we've got, first of all, one full revolution. So the lighthouse, or the light, is rotating, revolving, rotating at, all right, one full revolution per every eight seconds. One full revolution is two pi radians. So it's d theta dt, the rate of change of the angle with respect to time. It's constant in this problem. It is two pi radians, so one full revolution, two pi radians every eight seconds. Um, in eight seconds. So we get pi over four radians per second. That's what d theta dt is. Now we need to relate that to x because we're after, we're given information about theta and d theta dt. We're after information about dx dt. So you have to relate theta and x somehow. Well, but this, this is a trig problem. You've got, here's theta. You know this side is 0.25. I'm going to drop the units. We know all our distances are in miles. All our times are in seconds. And this is x. Tangent. Tan of theta. Opposite over adjacent. So tan of theta. Tan of theta is x over 0.25. So what do we get out of this? If you multiply both sides by 0.25, x is 0.25 times the tan of theta. OK. So what do we got? We've got 
I'll draw this triangle again. We've got this side's x, this side's 0.25, this angle is theta. We just found x then is 0.25 times tan theta. And we're after dx dt when x is 0.5. This is what we want. Well, theta is a function of time. X is a function of time. These are both function, both sides of this are functions of time. You differentiate with respect to time, so with respect to t. Now, this is a function of theta, but theta is a function of t, so you'll get the chain rule over here. The chain rule will come in, so you differentiate both sides with respect to t. You get 0.25. And then the derivative of this with respect to t, well, you can write it as the derivative of that with respect to theta times d theta dt. Right? The chain rule in this notation with the d's, in Leibniz's notation, looks like cancellation of fractions. It looks like this d theta cancels with that d theta, and you just get the derivative of tan theta with respect to t. So what this means is we get the derivative of tan theta with respect to theta, derivative of tangent, is secant squared. We just derive that. So we get secant squared theta times d theta dt. All right. d theta dt in this problem is constantly pi over 4 radians per second. So we get, here's the 0.25, which I don't know, I've got pi over 4, which is a fraction. I guess I'll switch from decimals into fractions. It's not like it really matters, but I'll change the 0.25 to a 1 fourth. The d theta dt is a pi over 4. And now I get a secant squared theta. This is dx dt at any time t, except you'd have to know theta at that time. We're not interested, or the question didn't ask for it, at every time t, but at the point in time when x is point, uh, when x is 0.5. So how do we answer this question? So what do we get here? What we've just seen is that we get pi over 16. Pi over 16 times secant squared theta when x is 0.5. All right, we could get out a calculator and do this, but you don't need to. Um, secant, secant of theta is 1 over cosine. Um, actually, Actually, why don't we use the, we could do it that way, but why don't we do this? We already wrote that x is 0.25 tan theta. All right. And we know that tan squared theta plus 1 is secant squared theta. Oh. We're after secant squared theta. Oh. So it's tan squared plus 1, but tangent in this problem is always x over 0.25. So this is tangent of theta. So tan squared, so tan squared theta is x squared over 0.25 squared. So tan squared plus 1 which is secant squared, the thing we still need to know, tan squared theta plus 1 is x squared over 0 0.25 squared plus 1. All right. This is, all right. So this is true in general, but, and this is secant squared. Right, this equals this. That's, that's a curvy equal sign.
But what we want to know is what this is when x is 0.5. Oh, well, when x is 0.5, this is x over 0.25 squared. When x is 0.5, that's 2 squared. This is just 5. This just equals 5 at the time we care about. This is pi over 16 times 5. Right? I'll say it again. This is, I never should have written this separately. This is this squared. And when x is 0 0.5, this would be 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.25, that's 2. 2 squared, 4, 4 plus 1, 5. So secant squared comes out to be 5. So you get this. What are the units on this? So we get 5 pi over 16. What are the units? It's x's units divided by t's units, miles per second. Is this big, small, reasonable? What is this? <laughs> Pi is about 3. So 5 pi is about 15. So this is about 1. This is approximately 1 mile per second. So how fast would the little girl have to run to keep up with the beam of light when it's 0.5 miles down the beach from P? And about a mile a second. Either that's one fast little girl from some other planet, or she's going to fail. <laughs> Good luck. All right, um, that's it. Uh, you should try lots of the exercises on, other, on the other trig functions. You won't get good at these without, without doing a bunch of problems on them. Next time, we have to talk about the inverse trig functions. So inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, inverse cotangent, inverse secant, inverse cosecant, um, and look at their derivatives and look at problems involving those. So. That's what we'll do in the next section.